worship. Um, you guys are free to stand. You're free to sit. You're free to, like I said last week, move around. You've seen me. I'm all over the place. I can't sit still when I'm worshiping. Uh, there's a time to do that for me. Uh, but let's just prepare our hearts. Father, we just come before you and we ask, Lord. Father, your goodness and your kindness, God, to remove anything that's keeping us from seeing you right now, Lord.
we talk about the goodness of God, we see that God is good. We're not just using it as like a describing word, as like, you know, like, I don't know, or, you know, like, um, she's pretty. It's like, when we're talking about saying God is good, it's, it's his nature, it's who he is. He can't not be. It's like saying I'm Mexican, and I can't just stop being Mexican. It's just who I am.
great day to be in the house of the Lord this morning, and I am excited for what God is going to do today. Uh, if you haven't met me yet, my name is Noah. I serve as our youth pastor here at Generations Church. Uh, and the one thing I like to say every week that I get to do announcements is, is this. It's, I don't know what you walked in here today with. I don't know who drugged you here, or maybe you came willingly. I don't know if you've been in church for a long time, or you haven't been in church for a long time. But I know one thing is, number one, is that God is good. Amen. And, and number two, that even if you don't believe the same things we believe, uh, that you belong here. Um, and that you have home here. And that you are welcome here. You are safe here. And I personally will celebrate every single week that you show up here. Because I'm just so excited for what God is doing. Not only in this church, but in each and every one of you guys. So, uh, with that being said, I've got a couple short announcements. First off, it is, if it is your first time here, on the back of the chair in front of you, there's going to be a connect card. Uh, I'd ask that you fill that out. We'd love to learn a little bit more about you and learn better ways that we can serve you as a church. So if you don't mind filling that out, that'd be awesome. Next thing we got is today is the last day, ladies, that you can sign up for the She Is Chosen conference. Uh, so that's going to be an awesome time. If you have any questions, you can chat with Diane about that. Diane, will you raise your hand real quick? So he's right up here in the front, chat with Diane, she will get you plugged in. Today is the last day that you can sign up to go to She Is Chosen Conference. Uh, that is happening this month. So make sure you sign up for that. It's going to be an awesome time. I know my wife signed up for it. Uh, and so make sure you don't miss out on that. Next up is every week we are having here from 9.15 to 10 a.m. We're having a time of fellowship where there's going to be coffee and donuts provided. We'd ask that you would show up a little bit early to church. Uh, to continue to build on the awesome community and family that is already here. Uh, we would just love to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, so there's going to be some awesome time for coffee and donuts right in the Refresh Cafe, which is straight down the hallway when you exit uh, the, the sanctuary. And then the last thing I have for you is this Friday night at 7 p.m. We have Josh Novi coming here. Uh, he is a famous comedian. Um, he has specials on Amazon, Dry Bar, uh, and many other things. And we actually have a short clip from Josh Novi uh, to show you a little bit about who he is. Mason, if you are ready to play that. It's my little way to do a CrossFit. CrossFit, that's where rich people throw farm equipment. That's a lot of fun. I think I'm going to say 
you get that face in the dumps? Because I'm loving it. things that 
than how good and pleasant it is. That means how pleasing is it to God when his people live together in unity. In Matthew 18, 20, like we talked about, it says, For where two or three gather, together as my followers, I am there among them. Right? Community is so important that Jesus says, when people get together for my name, my followers get together, I'm going to show up to them. I want to be there for them. Right? There's not other promises in scriptures where like, you show up at the football game and Jesus will be there. You know, there, This is one of those promises where if you can come together, Jesus shows up. And part of that is because we are the body of Christ. And when we are together, we're a body. But when we're separate and we're out on our own, we're just separate limbs. And so when we come together as a body, Jesus is there because we are his body. Community comes from two root words, very easy, common and unity. Right? This makes sense because as we move forward uh, here as a church, we're going to work on some common values. We're going to bring a vision to this church that we can all hold in common. And that we can work in unity towards. Because being in one vision brings unity. Having multiple visions brings division. And when everyone not only knows the vision, but moves towards the vision, it becomes common unity. And that's where community really starts. In the meantime, though, until we start declaring these things, we do have things in common. We do have unity on these things. It's why you're here. It's why you keep coming back today. You care about this church. We hold that the same. You care about each other. Because you come and you're here for it. You care about the community in which this church resides. Amen. Right? And so these things that we have, these values, we can still hold them together in common unity. Community in Scripture is purposeful. It's to cause jealousy and curiosity of the world around us that would draw them to Jesus. Francis Schaeffer said the world witnessing authentic spiritual community could be the last credible evidence of the Christian faith. John 13, 34 through 35, Jesus tells his disciples that I am now giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So how do we build a community that's filled with this supernatural love? This love that the rest of the world is going to see and go, oh, I want to be a part of that. I don't have that in my life. I need that in my life. They're going to come, they'll experience, they'll see the way you care for each other. And all of a sudden be like, why, why don't I have that in my life and be drawn into Jesus? How do we build that kind of community? It starts with loving each other. But like really loving each other. And you might be going, here we go with this love stuff again. I feel like that's all you've talked about on every one of your values. And uh, if that's how you feel, then we're probably not common in vision. Uh, but, like I said, the highest value we hold to in my first two weeks is loving God and loving others. And all the rest of my values are really just different ways to do that. Because that's the greatest commandment. And it's always going to come down to either loving God or loving others. Every part of your life. Everything that you choose, every, way, every decision you make, comes down to those things. And so as we talk through these things, the best way to build community does come from loving others. And in doing so, we're going to love God through that. So you're kind of going to have to get used to hearing me talk about that. And you should probably just embrace it and really hold to it in your own life as well. So the first way I believe that we build community is that it takes community to really learn love. So you can learn all the beliefs of Christianity by reading the Bible. You know, doing some studies and different things, and you'll have the knowledge of the beliefs of Christianity. But the problem is, it doesn't actually come into play into your life until you put it into practice. And you can't put it into practice without other people. Right? What's the greatest act of love? We've talked about this. Can we have an answer? Laying down your life for others. A couple of people said it, but I'm mostly here. He's uh, getting a little start later. Um, yeah. But, um, you, how do you lay down your life for others if there are no others? Oh, right? How do you learn to love and practice it if you're not in purposeful community? Genesis, the very, very beginning, God created Adam. And before he created Eve, he, he declared that it's not good for man to be alone. And we hear that often.
So God declared in Genesis that, that man is, is not good for man to be alone. Now, we use this verse a lot talking about marriage or finding, you know, that lifelong partner in your life. But the problem is it, it was really that he was there alone. And God realized all these things that, that I want for them, everything that I've built in them, can't be fulfilled without other people. And so the purpose of gathering together is not just so you guys can come hear a message from me or those type of things. It's because God needs you to have other people in your life. The catchy Christian lingo for today would be doing life together. Right? You, you may have heard that phrase, you know, we're just here doing life together. You know, come and eat in my house so we can do life together. You know, those type of things. And it, I find it a little bit cheesy, but the reality is that's what God is looking for. That's what community really means. In the book of Acts, we find the very first gatherings as Christians, that this is what our churches are based off of today. So if we look at Acts 2, 42 through 47, let's make sure they're coming from me. Uh, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions. They shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. And they shared meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. There's a second century historian um, and he's explaining Christians in this writing that we have um, to the Emperor Hadrian. And this is how he describes the Christians. He says, they love one another. They never fail to help widows. They save orphans from those who would hurt them. If they have something, they give freely to the man who has nothing. If they see a stranger, they take him home and they're happy. As though they were a real brother. They don't consider themselves brothers in the usual sense, but brothers instead through spirit. When we look back at those verses and Acts, these things that they're doing came from just meeting regularly. And at the very end it says that each day the Lord added to their number, to their fellowship, those who were being saved. Because what they saw was this real authentic community that God said, if you can have that community where you really love each other, people will be drawn to you. And that's what was happening. But there's something in that verse, I believe, you know, we do a lot of those things. People gather, we eat. Uh, we, we, we learn together, we do communion, we worship together, all those things. But there's something in there that is key to growing the church all the way back then, and it's key to growing the church today. And that key thing was the word devoted. It says they were devoted to it. Can you say devoted? Okay, just make sure you're still awake. Unity happens at devotion. From what I can tell from meeting with the people we've met with so far here is that you guys agree with a lot of the values that I'm sharing. It's part of the reason that I was picked to come and be a part of this position is because the values of my life line up with the values of this church and this community. And you've probably heard teachings on this before. These, these aren't brand new things to you. And you're excited to see what God does next. And you're coming because you want to see that happen. But you know what that doesn't do anything. I'm excited that you agree with my values. I think it's nice that you're excited to see where God is going to take all this. But devotion to seeing the vision happen is where change happens. That's where community will happen. Devotion to being part of the vision. Devotion to each other. And devotion to just attending things, not because we want numbers, but because it shows you're devoted to each other. We will never have real community until we become devoted to some of these basic things. And one of those first things we need to be devoted to is showing love to each other. Right? And the greatest act of love is laying down your own life. Like getting over yourself. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Romans 12, 9 through 10 says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. That last phrase, take delight in honoring each other, I think sometimes we're like, mm, I'll honor that person. 
You know, like, because they're my leader, because I'm supposed to. It's like, do you actually delight in that? Galatians 6, 2 through 3 says, share each other's burdens. And in this way, you obey the law of Christ. And if you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. You guys have probably heard these verses. I have shared them in, the, in different parts of this series. Because that's how important they are. I read a book recently, this quote says, There are two types of people in this world. Those who are humble and those who are about to be. <laughs> and because God's desire is for us to care for each other. Yeah. But that involves choosing to serve other people. That involves looking at other people's interests as higher than your own. That involves choosing to be humble. You know, Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride comes before the fall or comes before destruction. And this happens because God says, well, if you think you're so great, you, you can do life on your own. But he created us for people, for each other, and the world will not work. It's more important to God that we care and be devoted to each other and build community than it is for you to build your own life. We must lay down our rights for one another, and that means to serve each other. We talked about this last week, that we are called to be more like Christ. We we're supposed to, being a Christian is being Christ-like. And he is our ultimate example of what we're supposed to be to the world. And Jesus came, as he said, to serve and not to be served. Right? How often do we look at life and be like, man, I wish life would just treat me better. Right? And that is basically saying, I'm here to be served. Why aren't these better things happening to me? Why aren't these people doing this stuff for me? Why is my job not recognizing me? Now, I'm saying that there's definitely some unhealthy work environments out there. I'm not saying suffer through all that, but I'm saying maybe adjust your attitude to, to remember that you were called to come and serve. One of the best ways to serve each other right here in our own church is to volunteer somewhere. Right? I'm not asking for you guys to give up every Sunday and every moment of the rest of your life, because right? we do need poured into at times. Right? And to be honest, that should be happening in your own devotions outside of Sunday mornings. But I totally understand needing this time. But you know that if we all stepped up and we all volunteered somewhere, we'd be able to have enough people to allow you to be in here and to serve in a rotation and all sorts of things like that. And we need to get, you know, Lisa and Bonnie out of kids once in a while and mingle with adults so they can stay sane. Uh, <laughs> You know, and people like Mason, who's been back there in the booth for years and years. I, I, I don't know how long, but it sounds like for forever from our last conversation. And that's just not okay. Right, Mason? No, oh, he says no, but don't listen to him. Uh, but guys, it's not going to happen until we step up. Right? Volunteering in places and serving each other to grow our family. Showing up to serve when you're scheduled and to be a part of it serves this community. I know it takes extra work to volunteer and to serve, right? You might have to wake up early and be here a little bit before a regular time, um, right? That's a sacrifice for some of us. But if you came to serve others with that attitude at all times instead of being served, man, imagine what a church would look like. Imagine what a community would look like. Imagine just in your group of friends that if that was always your attitude. Like we can't have community without volunteers, without, you know, even serving the community around us, without people who are willing to leave and willing to clean, willing to greet or willing to watch kids. Volunteering to serve is love, which is community building. Churches that become a vessel to help people become spiritual blessings, right, where we try to take in more than we need. Right? It's not because we don't need more Jesus. I think we could always use more Jesus. But if we're not pouring out anywhere, we actually can't take in anymore. If you picture a sponge that's fully saturated, and you dump more water on it, it doesn't take in more water. Right? And we were created like that, where God wants to be poured into our lives, but if we're not pouring out, then there's no more room for God to pour in. And that's where serving comes from. You know, if we're not pouring out, then we're kind of just becoming moldy cons. You know, you may wonder why your life stinks a little, and why things aren't going so well for you. It's because there needs to be some movement in you. Right? And attending things outside of church is not serving. Right? Like going to youth group after church on Sunday, you're not serving somewhere. Teams, you should serve somewhere as well. 
Right? There's plenty for you to do. Then you don't have to be bored by my message because you'll have something to do. And, uh, you know, just going to events that are happening outside the church, that's awesome. We should go there to build community, but that's not serving. I know that many of you guys are excited to see the church grow. We've had this conversation. You're excited to see where we're going. And uh, we can't grow without you. Now, this is not supposed to be the Andrew show. Right? I want this to be very opposite of that. I want you guys to be empowered to do what God has called you to do. We were talking just this past Wednesday night about how, you know, like sports teams are centered around the quarterback or the pitcher or things like that. And like if a game goes bad or a game goes well, you know, those are the people who get blamed or, or get all the honor, even though it's the whole team effort. Now, often churches tend to somehow be like that as well, where the pastor gets all of the praise or all of the, you know, not praise. And uh, it's not supposed to be that. We're a team. We're all supposed to be in this together. And really, the reality is my job as a pastor, as a leader of this church, is more to sit back and to coach and put you guys into play and train you and empower you to do what God's called you to do. Like, this is not a place to come and sit on the bench. And it will never be that place. I will continuously, if you think you're a bench warmer, I will keep pushing you out into the field, you know? And I'll get people to fake injuries or whatever we gotta do to get you out there. Because that's what God's called for you. And there's a life that's better than coming to the city. We have places for you. Right? And your commitments can vary. I, some of you guys maybe want to be all in and some of you like, I can do once a month. Just start somewhere. And see if it fits. Right? Find a spot and say, like, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot for a couple months. And if it's not for you, then that's fine. We'll find another spot for you. Because we're a body and I understand that different parts work in different places. And we have lots of places. There's a little card that was out on your seats um, every other, so you can grab more if you, uh, you know, pass it around to make sure everybody gets one. But um, there's a temporary spot. Maybe like, let's see how this serving thing really goes. Okay, you don't want to commit long term. We have the Harvest Festival coming up, and we need a lot of volunteers so that we can serve our community. Uh, we have 600 plus kids come through here and uh, have a good time, and it gives us opportunity to show. That are to our community that we're here just to serve them and to bless them. And uh, so we need a lot of volunteers for that. So maybe that's something you want to give a shot for. You can mark that on that paper. For children's, we need a lot of people in children's. And maybe you don't like kids. And so, right, don't serve with kids, okay? Uh, <laughs> we don't want you there. But maybe you like, I really feel called to help some way over there. Then you can do check-ins where you talk to the adults, okay? Uh, like I said, we need to give Mason a break. And you can, you can do that. If you guys have a smartphone and know how to run it, for the most part, you can probably do the majority of the things that we need you to do now. Okay, so I think a lot of people are intimidated by that, but it's not as techy as you think it is. Uh, when it comes to problem solving those issues, Mason's got it. So, we just call him up and come out and uh, We want to start a prayer ministry team that during that time of prayer that we do during worship, that there's people that are open and ready to go and pray for people. Maybe if that's something that you enjoy doing, sign up. Okay, we, we need people that are greeting. Maybe you're like, I don't know about the spiritual side of things too much yet, I'm pretty new, but I can smile and I can shake hands. Then first impressions is a great place for you. Right? And maybe you're like, I just don't know where to start. I think it's one of the easiest places to, to start serving because you just hang out at the front of the church as people come in, you smile. If you can't smile, then maybe not for you. Uh, but. Shake hands and you welcome people in. We want to start a resource group and some different things like that. Um, hospitality. We want to give gifts to our, our visitors. We want someone to take care of like donuts in the cafe and things and uh, make sure it's a hospitable you know, place. Helping with youth. You can help with outreach events like the Harvest Festival. We have many spots on the worship team that can be filled. And so maybe there's something you want to do that is not mentioned and you're like, this would serve our church. You can fill that out on there. Um, Noah's going to be at the back of the church collecting them after service, and uh, he won't let you out of here until you hand them off. But <laughs> we're going to block all the doors. Uh, <laughs> now, another way that we lay, we lay down our lives for community is that we fight for unity. Right? Ephesians 4, 2 through 4 says, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Making every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, 
binding yourselves together with peace, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. See, this is what Paul was... Uh, oh, just lost my words. This is what Paul said about keeping unity, to make every effort. Do you feel that you make every effort to keep unity here? That when somebody brings up a problem, that, that you offer you know, a solution or how to handle it biblically, or do you just join in talking about it? Or do you even say, you know what, if you've got a problem, why don't you just go talk to Pastor Andrew or one of the trustees or somebody with it? Right? Or do you just allow it to happen? Or, you know, when a new person comes, are you making an effort to reach out with them and bring them into the community? Are you reaching out to the people you haven't seen in a while and saying, hey, man, I hope you're okay? Are you making every effort? Because making effort often means laying aside yourself for others, choosing their interests instead of yours. Peter in 1 Peter 4 8 said, And most of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. I, I just love that verse because I think often we, we see people, you know, we're, we're all sinners, we're all people who make mistakes. But we, we often want to point that out and cause it, well, I can't hang out with them, or they're causing an issue in our church because of this and that. But if you just love them, it covers a multitude of sins. It's, a, it's not just some nice spiritual idea. It's literally if you can just choose to love them and, and honor them and keep their interests above your own, then you'll probably be able to work through that moment in your life. You know, maybe there's a person here that you can't stand. No, it's not what you <laughs> but you know what I found is the people that usually bother me the most are the people that I learn most from. Because usually that's where I have a weakness. It's usually where I have a problem in my life that I need to work on some things. But if you come in with an attitude of they're better than you, because you're choosing to be humble or their interests are better than yours, you're going to be able to learn from them. And when you don't live like that, you're actually denying what God created. When you're just saying, man, that person's messed up. But you're saying, God, you're really bad at creating things. And he created you, so I'm just saying. Last week we talked, again, like I said, we, how to be like Jesus. Can you imagine Jesus handling himself like that? He walks into a room and is like, I can't be here if there's an air in here. Right? Could you imagine that, being Jesus? Imagine Jesus coming, showing up here and seeing you. And going, that person's got a lot of problems in their life. Paul, when he was talking to the church of Corinth, he gave them this advice when they were having conflicts. He said, the very fact you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Right? Choose to lay yourself down and love someone instead. Now, I understand that there's going to be groups of people that are closer than others here. But there's also, at times, cliques within churches and in those groups that don't allow other people to Right? And some of it is intentional, and some of it's unintentional. Because there's times where you're looking for someone to do something in the church, and you're just going to turn to the people who normally do things. But what you're doing is you're being, you're unintentionally excluding people. Because there's going to be new people. There's new people here today that, that are going to want to serve, but if we overlook them and we don't allow them opportunities, then we're excluding people from our community. You know, open your eyes a little wider to the people that are in the church. Right, your new best friend may be sitting across the church that you've never talked to. But all you got to do is take them out to dinner, take them out to lunch. It's not unity when people are being excluded, even if it's unintentional. Right, make every effort. Maybe you need to ask for forgiveness of somebody today. Maybe you need to forgive someone today for feeling that they haven't been keeping unity, or maybe you're the one that wasn't keeping it. You know, I really ask that you consider doing that. Down the road, we're going to start more community groups and things here. I mean, there are some of them happening, but I think that this is one of the most important, you know, ministries a church can have is what happens outside of Sunday mornings and in people's homes. Right? Devotion, if we look back to the book of, or, yeah, the book of Acts chapter 2, it talked about how they gathered every day. They gathered in homes, they gathered at the temple courts, they gathered in the temple. It was just they were getting together regularly and they were eating together in their homes. And growth happens when you become devoted to each other. Right? And that doesn't happen just showing up on Sundays. You're not devoted to someone if you see it once a week. Right? Could you imagine, you know, my wife 
I'm like, hey, I'm devoted to you, but I'll see you in a week. You know, like, we hung out for an hour, and during that hour, we actually didn't really talk that much. Someone else talked at us the whole time, and, and uh, we didn't really actually build on our relationship at all. You wouldn't call that devoted. Right? This is when you get into people's homes. You hear what's going on in their lives, and you get invested. That's where growth in community happens. When you move from just being people that gather to a family. Because with family, you don't need to wear a mask. Right? You're comfortable asking for help. You don't feel like you're in community. You're comfortable confronting and correcting each other. And you're comfortable with being confronted and corrected by family. Because you know it's out of love. Right? You're quick to fill a need for a family. Because we know that families are devoted to each other. Often because like, I don't even know if I love my family, but because you're family, I'm going to do this for you, you know? And not that that's the right attitude, but that we should be that level of devoted to each other. The great thing about that is you don't need that to be scheduled by the church. You should just be getting together outside of church because that's what community and family is. Cesar Chavez said, if you really want to make a friend, go to someone's house and eat with it. The people who give you their food give you their heart. So on that paper, there's community groups. If you're interested in hosting that, we'll probably have a meeting later about that. Um, another way to enjoy community here at our church is getting into our private Facebook group. It's a good place to have. Carry that community from Sunday to Sunday and you know, hopefully between gathering in person, but it's a good place to ask, ask for prayer requests or share what God's doing in your lives and encourage each other. Now, the last way that we can help cultivate community, healthy, authentic, spiritual, you know, authentic community that uh, Jesus is asking of us is by making this a safe place. Now, this kind of has two parts to it. And the first is that, we talked about it briefly, that the church should be a safe place to question and to doubt. Right? You know, and this should be kind of easy. If you consider the person next to you as better than yourself and they're doubting, then you want to call them into question. You'd say, well, maybe you have a real reason. Let's talk about that. Let's sit down and work through that together. There's a story in uh, Mark chapter 9 of a guy who comes to Jesus because his son is sick. And he, he runs to Jesus and he goes, Jesus, can you heal my son if you can? And Jesus responds, if I can. Right? Because he's Jesus. He is like, if I can, what do you mean by that? This man is clearly struggling. Right? He, he believes that Jesus can heal his son. But he's also doubting whether or not Jesus can heal the son. All in the same moment here. And the man responds, and you can see this struggle with him, because he says, I do believe, help my unbelief. Right? And don't we kind of live in that often in life where, God, I believe because I know who you are. I heard what was taught. I, I see it in other people's lives. So I believe, but I still need help with my unbelief. Right? And you will find yourself in those situations. And the church should be the first place where you should be able to come in and say, I'm struggling believing today. We should not be a church that says, you don't believe. This is a place for people who love Jesus. You know, get out of here. I don't know how you fit in this place. And it sounds funny, but people leave churches because they struggle. And somebody said, you know, your faith must be weak then. Right? You just must not really believe. You probably never really believe. Because they struggled. And that's not safe. That's not a community that Jesus would want. Because you know what Jesus did in that situation? He didn't shame the guy for struggling. He just healed his son. We need to be that for others. When life is going crazy, when it doesn't make sense, and someone comes here and they have that disconnect of believing but unbelieving at the same time, this is when we show up and we stand alongside them and, and because of our faith, whatever they're looking for may, be, may come to pass. But once they question, this still needs to be a safe place. And that means that after they leave, after we go home, when we're behind their backs, right, we can't gossip about it. We can't complain about the situations that are going. We don't go home and like, you know, I prayed with so-and-so today. It's a prayer request. You know, right? I have a prayer request for, for you, so and so struggling with their faith. And we, this is not a safe place if people are gossiping, if people are, are struggling, you know, sharing all these things without, you know, 
that real love for each other. This is very clear throughout the scripture. Philippians 2, 14 says, do everything without complaining and arguing. James 5, 9, don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. James 1, 26 says, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. Ephesians 4, 29 says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And there's even more verses, endless verses about this idea. It's a large part of the Bible. So don't gossip. It's not a simple thing. People will not want to be a part of community if they cannot trust each other. Right? Don't go on Facebook and anonymously talk about people. All right? That happens way too often. So, well, I'm not going to say who it was, but such and such happened. Right? This is the acceptable behavior. You're like, would you let your kids be like that? No, but like, as adults, we still do that. Now, this doesn't mean overall that we just let problems exist and sweep them under a rug. Like, that's not healthy either. There's biblical ways to handle conflict. But if you have an issue with something going on, there is a scriptural way to handle it. In Matthew 18, Jesus talks about it. He says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you want that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take two or three others with you and go back again, so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the people still refuse to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. When it says that, remember what Jesus did? He hung out with pagans and tax collectors. So, right? It doesn't mean you just pick them out, it just means you show them more love. But there's three steps there to handling conflict. And before we get there, I would say, consider whether your, if your problem that you're having is working. Right? Remember how Paul told the church of Corinth, you know, you can choose to just rather be wrong. You know, if it's not really hurting you, it's not hurting other people, it's not an action that keeps happening, maybe you can just let love cover a multitude of sins. But say it's still hurting people, maybe it's still causing problems, the first step is to go privately and talk to that person who's caused the issue, right? Don't go behind their back. You know, sometimes we, we do it in the idea of getting advice. All right, I gotta go talk to this person to, you know, see whether or not I should handle this, you know, or not. But just go talk to the person first. Often, most of the issues are resolved just by talking to someone. Right, just for an FYI, if you have an issue with something I say, come talk to me. I'm, I'm more than enough provoked to explain why I need to hear you out. I'll even take you to coffee. And I'll pay for, for lunch. Because that's the way it should be handled. Right? If the issue is not resolved after going and talking to the person, it says, go and find two or three witnesses and bring them along so that they can see that it's not just them. Now, what this doesn't say is go out and get your posse, your gang, and gang up on them. And make them feel real bad and intimidated into forgiving, you know, and asking for forgiveness. That's not what it's saying. It says, get some other people who've been treated the same way and go and see if it resolves the problem. If it doesn't resolve the problem, it's an issue within the church, then you come talk to the leadership about it. And then you let go. Now, this is something we can all do. So take a moment and think back to your last offense and see what's happened here. You know, did, did you do it like this? Did you handle it this way? Did it look like Jesus? Community should not only be a safe place, but it should be a growing place. Right before this next verse, uh, I'm going to share 1 Corinthians 12. It talks about the body being made up of different parts and how we can't tell the hand that we don't need it, or the eye that, you know, it's not, you're not useful here because you're not a hand. Right? Everyone's unique for the purpose that we need. 1 Corinthians 12, 25 through 27 says, This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is part of it. First, I love that this verse uses the word harmony. If you're not a musical person, this is a musical term. Harmony is a, a melodic line, it means it, it plays to music uh, in a song, but it's not the main melody. It exists to strengthen the main melody. At times, it's even purposeful that it conflicts with the melody causing, um, causing a dissonance, so that when it resolves, the melody comes out stronger. You know, and often in, 
in songs that you listen to, there are many, many, many different harmony parts. Every instrument technically is playing a harmony to the other. Every you know backup vocal is giving harmony to the main. Now I want to let you know you're not the main melody. Okay, often that's the problem is we all think we're the main melody and then it causes issues. But we are harmony. We are all harmony and Jesus is the melody. We exist to bring him into focus. And our unity is one of harmony. We work together to help the melody in all of our own differences. We're not just asking for uniformity here. Okay, we don't want that. I don't want you to be all the same. That, that is not the body of Christ. Like, I don't need a hundred hands, okay? Uh, well, to start, volunteers, they can take a hundred hands. But, uh, but right now, that's not what we need. I need you to be who God's created you to be. I love the picture that the rest of this verse paints. It says, when, you know, when something in your body is hurting, you don't beat yourself up. Right? Sometimes you're like, we're going to have to chop that off. But uh, no, you, you mourn. You fix it. Right? You go through a healing process with it. And that's how it should be with the body of Christ. Right? If somebody is hurting here, we should limp with them until they're healed. We should slow down to their pace and make sure that they're going to be okay and brought along with us. Not push them out because they're holding us back. But the best part is the other side of that is when one of us wins, we all win. And that's why you know, we, we start off our team rallies on Sunday mornings and other times we'll talk about our wins of the week. Because when you win, we win. We should celebrate together. We should you know, enjoy life together in our ways. But then we also mourn and we heal together at the same time. That's how we grow together. As we all win our own parts, we, we limp along together as we figure it out. We celebrate the wins of, of you finding your place and serving where you serve. And it turns into this beautiful picture of a community being a greater impact than any one person could be. So we're going to end with this. Um, there's a book that I was reading, and it talks about how the church needs more spiritual travel guides and not spiritual travel agents. Now, if you're planning a vacation and you want to go white water rafting, your travel agent can su suggest a few places. Maybe they hand you a couple of pamphlets, they'll send you some links, you know, and uh, some brochures and things, and they'll connect you to the right person so that you can go on this trip that you want. But their role is done. Right? They, they showed you where you need to go, who you need to talk to, and then they're out. But a travel guide not only knows the same info, you know, they're going to help you choose the best river, they're going to show you how it all works. They actually come and they're in there with you, right? They're handing you your gear. They're making sure it's on correctly. They make sure that you're going to be safe. They take you down to the river, then they get in the boat with you. Right? And they're going to guide you down the river because they want to be safe too. Right? They're going to show you how to paddle and when to paddle. And they're going to be there when you arrive at the end and they're going to celebrate you for doing it, even though they do it a hundred times. That's the kind of building of, like, of relationships that we need in the church. If you've been coming here for even just a few weeks, and you consider yourself a Christian, you should be transforming from that agent to a guide. Some of you have been coming here for a long time, and you're still just trying to be agents. Right? When somebody goes, hey, this needs done at the church, or I don't know how to do this, you know, how to read the Bible, or how to pray, you just point to someone else and say, you know, that person knows. <laughs> Right? And you're doing a real good job being this spiritual travel agent. But what God's asking you is to be the guide and say, you know what, let's, let's get coffee sometime and I'll show you. I'll show you how I read the Bible. I'll teach you what I know. This is called discipleship. If you are saved and you are trying to live a life like Jesus, you have the qualifications to be a spiritual travel guide. Because you can say, this is what I know. And then when you don't know, when they come here and say, but how do I do this? If you don't know, they say, this is how we find out. I'm going to go to my spiritual travel guide. And you can come with me and we're going to talk about it. Because that's what life looks like. That's what the Christian community should look like. The problem is we have everybody pointing to the pastor or pointing to a couple of leaders. But we can't handle all that. And we can't be a travel guide to everybody. But you guys can't. Being a guide gives you ownership compared to the, to the agent. Right? The agent isn't on your trip. They don't really care what happens. Right? They're going to say, these are some good places. 
you know, I hope that it was good enough that you call me back next time you have a trip. But they don't really care too much about how safe you are, whether or not your equipment's on right, whether or not the weather's going to be good for it. But being a guide gives you ownership. Because a guide wants to enjoy it as well. They want to be safe. And they really care because they're in it. And you need to have ownership of this church because you need to care for it. You should have your input in a place where you are doing your part in it. You should enjoy it. You should want it to be a safe place because you're a part of it. And isn't it easier to invite someone to something you own instead of somebody else's? It's always awkward to invite your friends over to another friend's house that they don't know each other. But it's pretty easy to say, hey, just come over to my own house. And that's some of you don't invite people to church because it doesn't feel like your church. But if you have that ownership, you can invite people here. So there's three actions to put this into practice right now. I feel like today was a lot. I'm sorry. I tried to cut it down. And somehow I just added more. Uh, but it's important. Guys. And I hope you see that. I hope you see that. Like, there's endless scriptures about what community looks like and what and how it should exist and look like Jesus and, and the love and the, the authenticity it should have. And so there's three actions to put this in practice right now. First off, put yourself aside. Okay? Think of others as more important. Control your tongue. All of that comes underneath that, putting yourself aside. Secondly, be willing to put in the time. And put in the time to serve others, whether you're committing to helping on Sundays to find a place to serve. You know, fill out that card. Um, you can put up a, a QR code. I think there's a QR code spot um, to get a transfer over. These are the technical difficulties that Mason needs help with. Um, you're good at that. Check the thing. Now, it, it's not Mason's fault. It's fine. Um, but fill out that card, turn it into Noah, where you want to start trying to serve somewhere. We're going to start trying to put people into places here. And um, some of these, I know you, there's people who have led these different areas, and we're not trying to take that out from you. We actually want you to step up and lead that. Still, so if you feel like we're overstepping or stepping on your toes, just come talk to me, because actually I just want you to do what you're supposed to do, and we're just going to give you a team and uh, train you and empower you to walk along with that, okay? Um, and then thirdly, so put yourself aside, put in the time for others, and thirdly, be a tribal guy. Gain ownership of this church. Right? The next time someone comes and asks about something, don't first think, well, oh, who can help them with that? Think, how can I help them with that? When we live in a supernatural community, it will draw people to Christ, because it's supposed to be something they've never experienced before. That's great. God, I thank you for your community that, that you call us to. God, I thank you for the example you set before us with coming to earth to serve and not be served. God, when we come into every situation that we're in with that attitude of how can I serve here and not come to be served? God, I pray that we would be able to have this guide-like attitude where we say, man, I, I'm sure I can help some more people in this church. And as people come to me, I'm going to step up and, and just take them under my wing and show them what I know. God, I pray that you put a desire in our heart to, to serve this church body and to move us forward. God, we thank you for everything you've done for us. That, that your example, not only of serving, but of love and laying down your life for us, even when we did not deserve it. God, help us to have that kind of attitude, the mind of Christ, to view everybody else as you know, greater than us, that we would take the humble attitude Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go be a community for Jesus today. Turn those cards into Noah.